invite you to turn it in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 this morning. This morning we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 19, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is a great, great chapter, one of my favorite in all of Scripture, because it talks about the resurrection. It's probably the lengthiest passage that discusses the implications and the theology of the resurrection. And so it's appropriate for us to to look at that today, to study that, to be reminded of how important, how vital the resurrection is. It's great we just got finished singing, Because He Lives... So many phrases come right flowing right after that. Because He lives, we can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fears are gone. Because He lives, then becomes that that anchor for our hope. It becomes the stake with which we can drive our lives down into and that we can endure whatever this temporal life brings at us. I appreciate so much this week that you have been praying for my father-in-law, Don Burgess, who uh, is now home from the hospital. Um, Prayer chain went out. He's Wednesday, we found out that he was taken to the emergency room. He's, there are spots uh, on his brain. They're not exactly certain exactly what those are. He's been fighting ca- cancer. And, uh, you know, it's those phone calls that, that nobody wants to have. You know, those, those things that really shake you to your core. And, and yet, those of us who have been transformed really by the resurrection. We can endure those times, we can endure these difficult days because we know that that our life is caught up in Christ. Our life is not in what we can see with our eyes and touch with our hands. There There is an eternal life coming. That there is a a resurrected life. And and not only that, but the resurrection should define what we do and how we do it. It it should help us to to serve in ways and, and cause us to have boldness in ways that we would never think about otherwise. And so... I started thinking about my father-in-law, who is a, has been a translator of the Bible for some 60 years. At age 22, after graduating from college, he went up and visited a tribe, the Tarumata Indians, up in the very uh, rough mountains in Mexico, and decided that's where he wanted to spend his life and his ministry. It's been a very tough road for him. Over 60 years, enduring all kinds of hardships and so forth. And I remember first meeting him and thinking, and I've always respected those folks that live so boldly for the gospel, whose lives really can only make sense if the resurrection is true. And I've, I want to live that way. And I, I believe that 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is written for those, for that kind of purpose. That, that our lives would be defined by the resurrection. Our faith is divi- defined by the resurrection and our life and our ministry ought to be defined by the resurrection, and it, it, it should shape the way that we can have an assurance 
and we can have boldness and we can have effectiveness in life and ministry and that we can endure hardship more than anyone else because we know that this is not all there is. And so we don't need to, to live a life caught up in ourselves and caught up in our selfishness, sort of, you know, enraptured in our own little caves and, and, and protection. But we can live boldly. We can engage the community. We can engage others with the gospel. We can live the way that God has called us to live, boldly. So I want to invite you to a very, very important part of Scripture this morning, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this morning I want us to look at these passages in verses 12 through 19 that really talk about the essential nature of the resurrection. Now, as Jesus in John chapter 2, verse 19, who really anchors all of his authority in his life and ministry on the resurrection, on his resurrection that would come. In John chapter 2, verse 19, it says that Jesus said, essentially, he's going to destroy the temple, and in three days, he says, I will raise it up. And that's my authority. Everything was banking on that resurrection. Jesus said, in effect, I'm staking my uh, authority, and my life and ministry on this claim, this resurrection claim. And so, if I'm not raised, Jesus said, from the dead at the end of my ministry as I claim, then I don't believe, then don't believe a single thing that I've claimed all would be worthy of rejection. But we know, we read the account earlier. Many witnesses, many proofs. In last year, we, we talked about those proofs. We talked about the witnesses to the resurrection. And so this morning, we want to then look at the significance of it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and look at verse 12 here. See, the Corinthians had many, many problems, and this is really only the uh, only theological problem that they had. They, they had many ethical, moral problems. They had lots of disunity in the church and so forth, and Paul writes this letter really to get them back on track. But one of the major ways in which he does that is to reiterate the significance of the resurrection. And there were some clearly that have began to wane in their commitment and in their thinking and maybe been affected by false teachers and they began to wonder about their own bodily resurrection. Look at verse 12. Now if Christ is preached, remember I said that Christ said earlier that his authority rests in the proof of the resurrection. So now Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? How is it that you've come, come to the gospel, how is it that you would profess faith in Christ, and yet you would reject the gospel? It is, let me be clear about this, it is impossible for you to be a believer and not believe in the resurrection. And yet there are many in our day and age that, that have started to wane in their commitment or reject all uh, outright the resurrection. The Seventh-day Adventists talk about soul sleep. The body dies and disintegrates and the soul and spirit rests forever. Materialists teach that uh, that. That life just disappears and there is an annihilation of soul or maybe even a, a, an out-and-out out re rejection of the immaterial body of man. In Eastern mysticism, they teach reincarnation. And the soul is continually recycling to one bodily form or one another. And so they replace it with 
reincarnation. The New Age philosophy teaches that uh, the, the immaterial part of man just is absorbed. It absorbs into some sort of force like Star Wars and all of that, uh, those kinds of things. The ancient Greeks disdained any kind of uh, physical body. And so the idea that, that, you're, that you would regain some sort of a physical body was reprehensible to them. And so they rejected out and out the resurrection. The Sadducees, we have heard many times before, was sad because we know that they rejected the resurrection. That's why, you know, they were sad, you see. They were the ancient liberals of our day. The atheists, of course, they reject the resurrection. In the Soviet Cyclopedia asserts that the, any kind of resurrection is a decisive contradiction uh, against scientific natural knowledge. And the religious modernists of our day have taken upon themselves to take a pair of scissors to the Bible and demythologize everything that happens that is spiritual and everything that happens is supernatural and rejected all of that. No matter how they got there, no matter how our modern day gets there, rejecting the resurrection is... Deplorable. It really carves out the, the, the essence of Christianity. The believers in all ages and all different times throughout the ages put their hope in the resurrection. I think about Job. Job 19 verses 25 through 27. Job says this, As for me, I know my Redeemer lives. And at last I will take my stand on this earth after my Skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God. Oh, we could go to Daniel, we could go to many other servants of the Lord throughout the Old Testament. The resurrection is preached from cover to cover. And yet there were some in this church who had serious doubts. They had been infected by uh, teachers who were probably caught up in that, uh, what we would say, New Age or whatever, the Greek philosophers. And they began to wane in their commitment to that, and it had a horrible effect. And so Paul writes this passage and, 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 and reminds us this morning afresh of the devastating consequences of, of rejecting the resurrection John MacArthur says this, because it is the cornerstone of the gospel, the resurrection has been the target of Satan's greatest attacks against the church. If the resurrection is eliminated, the life-giving power of the gospel is eliminated. The deity of Christ is eliminated. Salvation from sin, sin is eliminated. And eternal life is eliminated. This is no small thing. That is why this morning as we reflect on Jesus who said, I am the resurrection and the life. As we, rec as we recount the, the narrative of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we must take our stand. We must take our stand in the, against the modern teachers who would reject it. And we must be reminded that this is the anchor of our hope. Uh, this is the anchor of our soul. Th this helps us. This helps us. Because He lives, we can fill in that blank. Because He lives, we can live. Because, we, because He lives, we have hope. Because He lives, our faith is real. Because he lives, this is not all there is. 
Because he lives, we can live boldly and minister effectively and we can give all. We can put our shoulder to the plow and and not look back. We can be all in. We can be like the Apostle Paul in Philippians where he says, For me, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Why is he able to have this bold confidence and this kind of philosophy of life? Because death is not the end. And one when one lives for the resurrection, one experiences the resurrection in the life to come. And so this morning, I want us to look at seven devastating consequences that would resolve if there were no resurrection, as Paul is making his argument here. He said, this is no little thing that you are throwing out. The resurrection is to our faith very, very important, considering how devastating it would be without the resurrection. Look at verse 13, gives us our first consequence Our Lord would be lifeless if Christ had not been raised. It says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. Not even Christ has been raised. If death cannot cannot rise, then Christ is still dead and did not rise. And this would mean that Christ did not and truly conquer death and is not alive and interceding for us. What a devastating, devastating thought. And how that would affect our lives, how that would affect our faith. It is said of Mahat Gandhi, uh, hours and days before his death, he says this, my days are numbered. For the first time in 50 years, I find myself in a slew of despond. Phrase taken from Pilgrim's Progress, by the way. All about me is darkness. I am praying for light and there is no hope apart from Christ, which he is realizing. All life would be in the slew of despond if all of this was just what you and I see and experience and there was no resurrection from the dead. Christ had not risen and so we would not be risen. We would not have life. We would not be able to have the exact opposite mentality of Gandhi. Look at verse 55, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says this, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Notice the huge difference between finding yourself in a slew of despond and saying, death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? No, our life is caught up in the life of Christ. Because he lives, we live. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's the way to live. We live because the resurrection is true. We live because Christ lived. Because Christ rose. Look at verse 20 through 22, 1 Corinthians 15. But now, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came resurrection of the dead. 
verse 22, for as in Adam all died, but also in Christ all will be made alive. You see, there is. All mankind died in Adam. And there was a real death, a separation. But because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his life, we now have life. Those who believe have this newness of life. And our life is no longer about ourselves, no longer defined by ourselves, no longer lived for ourselves, but lived boldly and assertively and confidently. Even in the face of death, because he lives. Because he lives. So number one, devastating consequence. If the resurrection weren't true, our Lord would be lifeless. Christ would not have been risen. Number two, look at verse 14. Our message would be meaningless. The preaching of the gospel would be vain. The next disastrous impact here, if Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Our gospel is in, in, in vain. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3-4. through 4. That is sort of an early form of a creed. A creed really that just rehearses for us the, the elements of the gospel. Look at verse 3. For I deliver to you of first importance... And this is not tertiary. This is not secondary. This is not how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. This is important, so listen up. I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to to the scriptures. And then he recounts the witnesses and the proof of the resurrection. That's the message. The message is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It is of the first, most parent, parent more important, imperative message. Without the resurrection, the good news would be bad news. And there would be nothing worthy of preaching. Without the resurrection, the gospel would be empty, would be hopeless message and meaningless nonsense. Unless the Lord had conquered sin and death, making a way for men to follow in that victory, the gospel is meaningless. And we are all wasting our time. The message, the message is staked, it's anchored in the resurrection. No resurrection, no good news. No resurrection, no gospel. So without the resurrection, our Lord would be lifeless, and our message would be meaningless. And number three, our faith would be worthless. Look at verse 14 there. If Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And then it says, your faith also is in vain. That word vain means empty. It means useless. It means no purpose. And this comes right out of Ecclesiastes. You know that wonderful book? Vanity of vanity. All is vanity. Nothing of nothing. That's faith without the resurrection. is nothing. If the dead do not rise, Christ did not rise, and we will not rise, and we could say with the psalmist, surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. Or Isaiah, have I toiled in vain? Have I spent my strength for nothing and in vanity? Vanity. 
If the resurrection is not true, then all that is done in faith is vain. Abraham's life, vain. Sarah, Moses, David, the prophets, and every single one of us whose lives are dedicated toward Christ, vain. The prophets of old, the apostles, the preachers of all time, the believers of all time, ones who've been mocked and scourged and imprisoned and stoned and ill-affected and ill-treated and put to death, all of that in vain. What is Paul saying here? Listen, people do not die for something that is a lie. They don't do that. They, they, don't, they don't put forth this level of effort. They don't put up this level of commitment. They don't live this way for something they know not to be true. So because the resurrection is true, our faith is not in vain. Now we stake everything on the resurrection. We stake everything on the resurrection. Our Lord would be lifeless, our message would be meaningless, our faith would be worthless if it weren't for the fact of the resurrection. And number four, our witness would be truthless. Verse 15, we even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that we that he raised Christ, <clears throat> whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. And so there is so much there. The witness would be truthless, along with our faith. Morality and the doctrines of the apostles would have no credence, no loftiness, no truth, you see, it stands together and it falls together. It makes the testimony of the redeemed false. Lifeless, meaningless, worthless, truthless apart from the resurrection. Number five, verse 16 and 17, our righteousness would be hopeless. All men would still be in our sin. Still be in their sin. Paul then repeats what he has stated. If the dead are not rise, not even Christ has been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. And then he goes on to say, you're still in your sins. And thus, the saints are no better off spiritually than the sinner. If there's no expectation that they would be victorious over the flesh. We, we struggle, even as believers, with our flesh and in our flesh. And this side of heaven, there is no perfection. But we long for the day when we will take on our resurrected bodies and we will see Christ face to face. And we will be like He is. Romans chapter 4 verse 25 puts it plainly. He, is hand, he was handed over to death on account of our transgressions. And he was raised on the account of our justification. The resurrection validated forgiveness. The resurrection validated faith. The resurrection validated and authorized and stamped the appropriate Authority on the gospel itself. John 14 verse 9. After a little while the world will no longer see me, Jesus says, but you will see me because I live, you also live. And so the gospel promise. Apart from the resurrection, we would still be in our sin but Jesus came 
John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he said something very essential for us here this morning. Do you believe this? It, it is one thing to understand the resurrection. It is another thing to, to believe it with your head. And to understand as you weigh the evidence of this many witnesses. Of this many proofs. And say it must be true. It's another thing to do exactly what our Lord is calling all of us to do. To stake our life on it. To, to weigh our anchor of our soul and our eternal rest in who Jesus is as our Redeemer. As the resurrection Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. There is no redeeming life apart from the life that is hidden in Christ. And so the message of the gospel is here. If you're here this morning and you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, if you have never anchored your heart and your soul to the Gospel to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You need to do that. John 5 makes it very plain. Jesus is talking. He says there's going to be two very different resurrections. There's going to be a resurrection to the life. Leads to heaven. And there's going to be a resurrection to death. Yes, some will, some will be raised again only to experience true, eternal separation from God in hell. The second death. And so it is for us who know the gospel, it's for us for here to, to, to beg you, to plead with you, to see and read the passage that Paul is saying here. Listen, you, you must embrace the resurrection. You, you must embrace the gospel. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no one that comes to the Father but through me. There is one way. It is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is through profession of faith. It is belief in our heart. It is repentant faith in Jesus Christ that saves. Well, we must move on. Number six out of seven here, verse 18 this time. If the resurrection were true, our Lord would be lifeless, our, meaning, our message would be meaningless, our faith would be worthless, our witness would be truthless, our righteousness would be hopeless. And number six, our consolation would be comfortless. All past believers who have died would eternally be in perish. It says in verse 18, then those also who have fallen asleep in Jesus have perished. I love that. The New Testament always describes the death of a believer as sleep. As sleep. Because for the believer, we who believe will never experience death in a spiritual sense. That there will be a passing from this life to the next for sure. And it will be like a shadow moving from one reality to another. But it will be life to life. And not this life to death. Because death, death inherently, inherently 
means separation. And real death is separation from the glory of God, from the presence of God, which is the essence of hell. And so we're saying here, listen, with, without the resurrection, those who have fallen asleep, those who had died in this time, who were asleep, they never tasted death. They're in the presence of Almighty God. They're in paradise. But no, Paul says, listen, if the resurrection wasn't true, then they would have perished. But we know that that is not true. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, comforting the congregation here, Paul says, but we know, but, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who, there it is again, or asleep, those who died in Christ, so that you will not grieve as though as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. The resurrection is true. And those of us that are missing this morning in the pew, those of us that are family, as we gather together, it's difficult. We at some point had to say goodbye. But if they are believers and that we are believers, we will be yet united again. For the resurrection is true. And all of those who believe in Christ will never, ever taste the reality of separation from God. That is death. Therefore, we can stake it all. We can stake it all on the resurrection. The last one we'll talk about this morning, verse 19. Our lives would be valueless. Christians would be of the most, of most pitied among on the earth. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Our life shouldn't make sense apart from the resurrection. Listen, the church is defined by resurrection. We have life in Christ because Christ lives. We live. Resurrection Sunday, we're celebrating this morning. Every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. It came to define the church's worship. It came to define the church's hope. It came to define the church's activity and the church's mission. And so we see. We should be most pitied like insane people who are living some kind of hallucination. How dare we live our lives? Thinking of my father-in-law. Why would you live your life with tribal Indians for 60 years? Laboring day in and day out. Why would you do that? Our family. He finished the translation. We said, ah, you're going to retire. No, he looked over to the next mountain and he said, there's another dialect. They don't have it in their language. And he started that. That doesn't make any sense unless you believe in the resurrection. That doesn't make any sense unless you know the importance of the word of God that brings people to repentance and brings the knowledge of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It doesn't make any sense. Paul says this, 2 Corinthians 4, 17. This slight momentary affliction, I love that. It puts everything that has happened to me, all the negative events in my life, it puts it in a different category. 
because I've never been beaten. I've never been stoned. I've never been left for dead. No, we've witnessed and it's, it's been difficult. You know, we've had doors slammed. I've had people yell at me. I've had people threaten me. But they haven't beaten me and left me outside the town only to get back up and then go back in. That's what Paul here is calling momentary light affliction. And he says this momentary light affliction is working in us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. When Paul compares the glory that is coming in the second birth, the, 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 the second life, the resurrection in heaven, and he compares it to all the negative things and all the things that he's had to endure as a preacher, as a believer in Christ, he says that there's, the scale is broken. There's no comparison. It's all worth it. It is all worth it. And that's why, that's why he says in verse 58 at the end of this chapter, he said to the entire congregation, whatever your call, wherever God puts you as a believer, whatever kind of thing you must endure for the cross, For the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, whatever you must endure as a Christian, whatever kind of hostilities, whatever kind of things you must endure in this life, he says this, be steadfast. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Not in vain. Your life because of the resurrection is not in vain. Listen, apart from from the resurrection, our Lord would be lifeless. Our message would be meaningless. Our faith would be worthless. Our witness would be truthless. Our righteousness would be hopeless. Our consolation would be comfortless. Our lives would be valueless. It wouldn't make a bit of sense. But because the resurrection is true, because it is true, Christ lives and we live in and through him. Our message is meaningful and life transforming. Our faith is worth everything. It's more precious than gold. Our witness is true. Our righteousness is real because it is not Our righteousness, it is Christ's righteousness that was proven through the resurrection. Our consolation brings tremendous comfort because regardless of what happens to you in the here and now, there is eternity waiting. And it is eternity in face-to-face fellowship in glory that would that transcends any of our abilities to think as we think about heaven and our lives then are filled with value look at verse 50 and following there just want to close with reading this here verse 50 through 53 we need to stand and understand the transformation here 54 to 55, the triumph, and then the thanks. But now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit imperishable. But behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we all shall be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and will be changed. For this perishable must be, uh, must put on imperishable and this mortal must be, must put on immortality. But then this imperishable, this perishable will put on imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality then will come 
about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, we can stake our lives, our hope, and our eternity in the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection should challenge our lives and exhort us to excel still more. Look at verse 58 again. Therefore, beloved brethren, be steadfast. That means stand with conviction, immovable. Do not budge. You have the truth. The world wants to float from their truth to somebody else's truth. No, we have the truth, and it is an anchor. It is a steadfast platform for radical conviction. It's a call to stand with conviction. It is a call to serve with exertion. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. That is exertion. That means exceeding the requirements. We can go beyond. We can be bold. We can give all. Because we can never outgive the Lord because the resurrection is true. And it's worth it. Because our labor has a purpose. Knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. The only thing that is not in vain in this world is that which is done for the kingdom. That which is done... For the Lord, that which is will will go from this world on into the next, that which counts. And so our labor, our labor in Christ, following Christ, serving Christ, preaching Christ, it's not in vain. All because of the resurrection. The resurrection is true. And therefore we can stake our very lives and the course of our lives on it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of the resurrection. Thank you, Father, for calling us to such a wonderful purpose to be your ambassadors to spread the light of the good news of your death, burial, and resurrection of your Son. Father, we thank you also that this is not all there is. But this life is fleeting, it's passing away, and it's doing so quickly. But Lord, we thank you that we can entrust our lives knowing that this isn't all there is, and that we are awaiting our resurrected bodies. Someday we will see you face to face. And so, Father, help us to to anchor our lives and our ministries upon the resurrection and be compelled to live lives full of conviction, full of service, and full of gratitude for giving us such a high and lofty purpose to live for. In Christ we pray. Amen.